If everyone can please find their seats, it's time that we begin our public safety meeting. The Public Safety and Homeland Co uh, Security Committee will now come to order. Uh, if everyone would bow their heads as normal, we always start our meeting with um, guidance from the Lord, and I've asked Representative Frazier if she will please offer that. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy and we thank you for your blessings. We ask that you give us the guidance and ask that you lead our chairwoman and give her the wisdom and knowledge to lead this committee and do the will of the people. We ask these blessings in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At this time, we have three bills that are on our agenda today, and we will consider those three bills. The first bill will be House Bill 161, and I'm going to ask our vice chair if he will please uh, be in charge of our meeting at this time, for I will be presenting the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you can go ahead and proceed with your Bill 161. House Bill 161 was brought before this committee last year. It was known as the red light bill uh, in regards to the fact that uh, motorcycles cannot trigger the sensors at red lights nor the cameras that are, are put up for censoring. We have um, tried to take into consideration with House Bill 161. Today I, uh, we got the bill to the Rules Committee. Uh, it was in rules at the end of the session in April. It was recommitted back to the committee, so it actually has been passed out. After hearing much uh, communication in regards to House Bill 161, we have tried to go back and, and look at some of the issues that have been related to us. So I would like to offer uh, LC 352591S as a substitute to the bill. Uh, my understanding it should be in your folders um, that you have in front of you. What we have tried to do, and I have brought some extras here, if anyone would like to follow. What, what we have done, there was some question as to where we set an example of a, with exceptions for motorcyclists, and we've tried to go back. The uh, substitute that you will see here follows the same guidelines but what we have gone into is the code section that is in, uh, in relationship to signals themselves. Uh, we've created the Motorcycle Mobility Safety Act, and as you will see um, on section two, what has been done, we have quoted the current law, which is in regards to flashing red stop signals, uh, which is in the current law saying what you do, a vehicle of, of any size, motorcycles including, and should be bicycles. Uh, on page two, section two, we've also used the flashing yellow light, which is the caution light to us, and what uh, vehicles are required to do for safety procedures through a caution light. The third um, thing on page two, line 27, is now adding a new section, which is partially inoperable red signals. And this is where when lightweight uh, vehicles come up, whether it be a motorcycle, whether it be a golf cart, as you know, that are getting on the roads now. And actually, in one of my towns, Springfield, Georgia, they are passing an ordinance for golf carts to be on the road. Uh, and this will follow suit there. We also have, as you know, many new small cars that are coming out and not able to trip these sensors are being noted by the the uh, cameras that are at some of the traffic lights. We followed the same procedure stating in here that uh, all of these vehicles would follow the same facts of uh, traffic control signals as necessary for safety and that it also says about our 60 seconds which we had before is that you have to stop as if it is a stop sign in order to make sure that you know it is um, a partially inoperable uh, red signal that you have there to give you the go ahead. So basically what we've done is tried to shore it up to be a more safety concern factor, addressing the concerns of various individuals that have come forward. And I bring you this proposal to the committee at this time. Okay, after hearing it, uh, are there any questions? Yeah. Okay, number 19, uh, Representative. Mr. Chair? Yes. Oh, thank you. 
Um, Madam Chairwoman, can you explain to me now? I, I was here when this bill was initially introduced last year, and and I and I was concerned also about the motorcycle stopping. But now you have the sixty. Is this a sixty second? Oh, sixty second rule in it. Now, who is going to who is going to determine? Um, uh, whether they sitting down for 60 seconds because I, I know motorcycles that just just going to go to that stop sign and they're going to look around, they're going to take off. So now am I as a, am I to make citizens arrest now or what? What am I to do? I'd like to be able to make some citizens arrest <laughs> if you want to know the truth. Um, 60 seconds gives you an adequate time to tell if that light is inoperable and anyone would need to stop when they come up to a traffic light that is red that you're not going to proceed immediately. Uh, 60 seconds, uh, we had thought, uh, talked about one time doing 120 seconds, which is mm. two minutes. And um, many of us that ride motorcycles, when you come up to a stop sign, two minutes is very hot in 100 degree weather. And when I am riding my, my bike, you can be assured that I'm fully uh, dressed for protection with the, the avenue of the, the jackets and um, also protection on the legs. and uh, Two minutes is a long time in very hot weather, so 60 seconds is adequate. And judging from that, up a caution light where you've got the red on one side, you're going to stop, and, and it's going to take you a good 60 seconds to view to make sure that you can proceed with safety. Mr. Chairman, a further question? Okay. Uh, Madam Chairwoman, how um, how will this legislation get out to the motorists, the motorcycle uh, drivers? I'm not a motorcycle driver, but I'm a motorcycle passenger. So how there, is there? The are, <laughs> there are many clubs that we have in our areas. Uh, this also, it, this was a question that was brought up last year. How do you get information out? It's like any other piece of legislation, that mm -hmm. when it's passed, uh, it's up to to us as individuals to help get that information out as legislators. I do a column. Um, I also do a, a mail out to let people know some of the things that are passed, and continuously I provide information in the paper. What the the other organizations do, whether it be with um, in public safety or any other avenue, uh, whether it be with our counties or cities, those, those things are sent out to the various individuals. So again, it's up to us as individuals. I'll tell you what other states do in the case of motorcycles uh, and small cars or vehicles that go the, in the same principle with the red light problems that they have, and we've got about 11 states already that have initiated this, but they have gone back to the old way of saying it rather than looking at the traffic lights and putting it into the law as currently with traffic lights. What they do is they carry the law with them so that uh, they know uh, exactly if they, they do get pulled over by law enforcement that they can show that they're not breaking the law, that they have provided the certain avenues of safety procedures before they go out. Another avenue that we do with, with public safety and law enforcement, a lot of times they get an update through their associations. We as motorcyclists, are, there are many associations in my district. Uh, we have that from the group with our Christian motorcycle group. We have it with the group with Harley Davidson. We have ABATE. We have many other groups that are organized. We even have a police group that rides out and they help provide the information out to, to their members and their associations throughout. So again, it's like any other piece of legislation, whether it be this piece of legislation or others, it's up to us as individuals to help get it out to our constituents and to the public. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, but I hope this, I hope I don't have to get this information out. I really hope it's in the driver's manual or, or, or in the state law where they actually know about it. Well, and, and I hope so too. Um, as you know, when you take a motorcycle course, well, I guess you don't know since you are a passenger, a passenger rather than a driver. Yes. But uh, if you take, uh, go out to, to get your license, it's uh, very dynamic uh, in terms of you study a long time. Uh, it's not as easy to drive a motorcycle on a road as it is a car to my intention. And I'm telling you, I thought I was going to hyperventilate trying to do my driver test uh, as I was getting my license to make sure that, that I could do because you don't drop your bike and you make 90 degree turns that are very narrow turns uh, as you practice. Also, safety courses are provided. Uh, and I would think that this kind of thing would be in those safety courses. This is through our governor's de Department of Public Safety for roads. And those things are added in there to the, the books. Through the driver's license manuals that you get to study from, 
I would hope that this would be also included in the updates. Okay, Madam people. Chairman, I'm going to support it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure that everybody understands that we're not trying to get special attention. Thank you. Are there any more questions? Okay. Uh, can I hear a question? question? Motion. Motion to pass. I, Rep Representative Neal, I saw your line. I, I will second Representative Frazier's motion to, to do pass. Okay. I've been motion and second that the uh, bill uh, do pass. All those in favor of passage, say aye. Aye. No? Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I uh, would would like to ask that what we passed is the substitute to House Bill, a committee substitute, which was the, the bill of which we were discussing, LC 352591S. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we will follow along. Now we have Representative Bill Hembry. Uh, this bill also was explained. Both of these bills were had a public hearing. Uh, we have had public input on these bills. And Representative Hembry, uh, we has, has asked for House Bill 828, and I have acknowledged that that is permissible, that we would take it up first. Late 28. This measure simply makes it a felony if you elude law enforcement in a motor vehicle. It also says that uh, the motor vehicle must be forfeited in the event that the felony occurs. I think it's a strong message that it sends, and I think it's important that we, uh, we basically uh, do all we can to protect the citizens of the state. We've all experienced or read about or watched these high-speed chases on our highways. We've seen law enforcement officers uh, their lives being put in danger, innocent uh, people on the highways uh, being struck. So I just wanted to simplify the process. Currently, it's a misdemeanor unless five conditions are met. This simplifies the process and says that if you elude law enforcement in a motor vehicle, you will be convicted of a felony and you will have to forfeit the motor vehicle. So I think it's a strong message and I hope that the committee will consider this favorably. Representative Hembry, uh, let me also ask you one question before we take questions from our committee members. But through the public hearing, uh, there were some suggestions uh, to you in regards to both of these bills. And I, as uh, the chairman had requested that perhaps that you look at those, uh, consider those, talk with legal counsel and see in what direction you might want to go. Can you tell us the results of that? Yes, ma'am, I can. Having spoken with legal counsel and a, and a very wise, the best legal counsel, I would say, in the General Assembly, uh, and she's worked closely uh, with law enforcement in the past, which I found out about, um, this language that has, she has drafted uh, is, is very, very well defined, and we decided based on that fact that we should probably keep the, uh, the measure as it is because it does simplify it. And that was our whole goal, was to make it as simple as possible, uh, not to add any more conditions, because then we get back to where we were before, uh, those triggers. So uh, with her wisdom and, and knowledge, uh, we felt like this was the, the best piece of legislation that would be good for law enforcement, as well as good for the general motoring public out there in saving lives. All right, we have several questions here. Uh, Representative Frazier. Uh, Representative Hembury, uh, does, does this pertain to 15 years old and, and older? Is no, this I want to clarify that because you, you all brought that up in the hearing. And help me out, if you're 17 years of age or younger, you will be classified as a juvenile. And that would be uh, dealt with in juvenile court, which the felony issue would not come up. It okay. would not be a factor. So your question the other day, uh, was would my, would a 15 year old become a felon? Right. No, because it would be handled in juvenile court. Okay. Thank you. Any additional questions in regards to House Bill 828? Representative Collins. Yes, Madam Chair. 
I just had a question, and it's on both bills, and I was just curious. You added the impersonation of an of an officer. There's no, it's not tagged back to a code section as far as punishment. That's already existing law. So you just wrote it in? Is that what we're we doing? We just wrote it in, and it's underlined, and we thought about taking the underlying uh, off, but we decided not to because, help me out here. I knew it was, I mean, it couldn't, it was illegal to start with, but I was just curious as to why there wasn't a draft our legal back counsel. here. Uh, those provisions are word for word from the original law. It remains a uh, misdemeanor, and uh, the reason we chose to underline was we were afraid it would be confusing to uh, pull down the larger volume of the entire code section that we're amending. Okay. So it was just a drafting decision. Thank you. That's just a curious question. Thank you. Any additional questions, comments from the committee? Representative Maddox. There we go. Um, question with regard and I missed the I was presenting a bill when you were presenting this in this committee earlier but the two bills what was the what prompted the decision to include all this forfeiture language originally the intent was just to have the classification from a misdemeanor to a felony but in discussing it with several folks in law enforcement as well as members of this body they felt like we needed to do something stronger and that the forfeiture of a vehicle, a motor vehicle, was one of the strongest things you could do to the bad guys out there to take away their their property. Uh, and so we felt like it was the strongest message to possibly act as some type of deterrent not to do this again. And I was reading on your summary there um, that the forfeiture would not be considered absolute unless there was a conviction. That I mean, that's different from current forfeiture law isn't it? this was taken directly from the current forfeiture laws that was uh, have you to our right? leg legislative council <laughs> that is in existing law relating to uh, the DUI for forfeiture provisions not the drug forfeiture provisions um, but that, that is mirrored from, from <laughs> what's existing there just the same okay Thanks. Additional comments? Do I have any other questions or comments from committee members? Representative Frazier? I just, I just have uh, one other question, Representative Henbury. Um, now, if my 17 year old is driving my car and get in a high speed chase with a police officer, you're going to confiscate my car. Only if you gave that 17-year-old permission to drive your car. And then I, it's my responsibility to get my vehicle back. You'll get your vehicle back. And he will be charged with a felony. You'll get your vehicle back. He, and he's 17, so he would not be because that would be handled in juvenile court. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to understand this because we do have children that, every, that, that are afraid of the police. And sometimes they will run from the police. And I just don't want to get in a situation where, you know, we, I'm, I'm getting, uh, parents are getting their vehicles taken and, and it's just going to cost too much of a financial situation. Although I'm concerned also about the safety factor. I, I understand that this child shouldn't be doing this, but in some cases they do do that. They're, they're afraid of the police. Everybody is, uh, the police is not everybody's friend. And so, um, although they try to be, but sometimes children just get in a situation and they'll take off. I'm not talking about adults. I'm talking about children, and I'm speaking to you from a rural area. You know, you, the, most of these high-speed chases are done in the, in the metro area. I mean, out in the country where I am, they just speed. They just take off. So um, I'm just trying to understand how am I to, to get this message out, especially to my children that are in the high schools mm -hmm. out there, to let them know don't, don't just take off now. You've got to be very careful if the police is behind you or whatever. Just to give you some comfort, I went home and talked to my 16-year-old son. And I told him that this measure that I'm introducing uh, would would uh, cause some serious problems for him as an adult. But I informed him, as a young driver, you always should abide by the rules and the laws. And if you're signaled to pull over, you do it. 
And so I think it's a good message. Again, uh, mostly juveniles, uh, so it won't be, they won't be affected. But I have a 16-year-old, too, and I wanted to make sure that uh, I wasn't endangering or causing more problems, uh, you know, for him if, if he just made a bad decision, right. just made a bad decision for one time. Thank you. Does that conclude your questions, Representative Frazier? Representative Jackson? Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Representative Hambury, if she does get her car back, she gets her vehicle back, does she pay impounding fees? To get her car back, I had a situation where a car was returned, but the f impounding fees were like $500. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to the impounding fees. I'm not sure. Thank you. But that's a good question. I'll find out. I'll find out. Representative um, J. Neal. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chairman Henry, thank you. For, for this piece of legislation. I just wanted to follow up with uh, Representative Fraser's question about uh, family vehicle. I, if, if I'm reading correctly, um, in, uh, in lines 124 through 127, uh, if, if it's a vehicle that I've loaned to somebody, for that vehicle to be seized, I, I would have to be I would have to know that that operator of that vehicle is likely to flee from police or my vehicle would not be seized. Is that correct? Am I reading that correctly? Correct. And again, this is the current forfeiture law. This hasn't changed anything. It, it, this is the current forfeiture uh, statute that's in place now. And. and then beginning on line 128, if, if that vehicle is the only vehicle that I have, my family, and uh, the judge determines it would be a financial hardship for that vehicle to be forfeited, the judge can uh, see that the benefit to the family keeping the vehicle outweighs the benefit to the state, and forfeiture would not, be, would not take place in that circumstance either. Am I correct? That's correct. Thank you. Again, this is the, the goal here is to make it so that uh, the jury and the trial judge can make the final decisions. You know, putting a law enforcement officer in a position where they have to determine five conditions, are they meeting one of those five conditions as they flee? That's a terrible thing to put a law enforcement officer in. To have a, a, a motorist on the highway just driving down the road and be blindsided by someone who's eluding police. That's wrong. So we're, we're putting a, a, a statute in place that I think is the right thing to do, and it, it gives the discretion to the people who will ultimately decide. That's the jury and the judge. Representative Taylor. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question was similar. I was concerned about a, a company vehicle. If someone was using a company vehicle and for whatever reason broke the law and ran, again, I wanted to make sure the company would be protected. Right. Thank you. Do I have any other questions from committee mem members or comments? Okay, please. Representative Mattis. Um, on line 51, when it refers to the district attorney, it can release a vehicle upon a bond being posted. And I'm assuming that would be a bond in an amount that's similar to the value of the vehicle. It, when, if somebody posts a bond, and I've never done a DUI forfeiture, but if they post a bond and get the vehicle back and then they're convicted, can they then just turn over the, the whatever's securing the bond instead of the vehicle? they put up a cash bond, for example, and get their car back, do they keep their car and turn over the cash? Again, that's current um, law in place now, so we aren't changing anything. So whatever the current guidelines are regarding bonds and the DA, they wouldn't change. Thank you. To our legal counsel, did you want to add anything to that? Okay. Any additional questions? Seeing none, um, Representative Talton. First of all, I'd like to thank you for this bill. And 
considering all the tr uh, what we see today with people chasing people, uh, with our law enforcement officers, is not just uh, the car being seized, but it's with the lives of other people out there. And uh, if you got a 17-year-old, 16-year-old, whatever, if that kid is killed, uh, just another thing. Or they kill three and four people, and now these days you hear several people are being killed. So by being a former law enforcement officer, I'd like to uh, thank you for bringing this bill, and I'm support you 100%. And at this time, I'd like to make a motion that this bill do pass. All right, I have a motion. I have a second. Do I have any further discussion on House Bill 828? Yes. Representative Collins. Yes, and just in a matter of discussion, one, I have, and the author and I have talked about this, I have the utmost respect uh, you know, for this. I, I will be much more in favor of 827 than 828. I just have an issue on the on the forfeiture side. This has needed to been done. I have worked with our DAs and others to, to look at this issue. I'm glad you brought this forward. Um, I think it needs to to move forward. I think also to address uh, Representative Chairman Taunton's, uh if we go ahead and pass this, make this a felony, if they do run, um, at that point, we got felony murder rule because they're committing a felony at the time that they commit if they go forward. So it's going it's going to be another issue there. But this is a good bill. I'm glad you brought it. I'm just more in favor of 827 than I am 828. And that's I just wanted to make that clear before the vote. That's fine. Uh, any other comments from our committee members? All right. Seeing none, uh, call for the votes. All those in favor for our House Bill 828, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed? That uh, we have one opposed. And the ayes carry, and this will be forwarded uh, on to the rules. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the committee. Thank you very much. Again, uh, thank you. As you know, this, these bills were previously heard as at a public hearing. That's why we did not take any comments from our audience today in regards to that. Um, do I have any further business to be taken up by this committee at this time? Seeing none, this committee meeting stands adjourned. <laughs>